And not only am I one life, but there are countless saints across this globe who are experiencing this. But they're probably not the superstar demigods that you're watching. Because God doesn't want any other name to be louder than the one name that saves. And that's his son. There's only one name. It's not John Chabaglian that'll get your name written in the book of life. And ironically, we built we build empires based around individuals who can't get us to the most important place in the world, which is in right standing with God. Hello, my friends, and welcome to episode 148 of the Between You and Me podcast. This is the place where we talk to music makers about the things that hurt, heal, and change us in church culture, and we have a bit of fun at the same time. My name is Jessica Morris. I'm an Australian music journalist, and I can't believe that we are nearly at 150 episodes. Dang, how did that happen? I'm really excited for you to hear the interview we have today. We've had some incredible guests the last few weeks who've been willing to speak about some really tough topics and, and stuff that's slightly left a field in like the evangelical culture. Uh, we've talked to Stockholm Worship and like, er- Eric Lilgero about how Hillsong Church in Sweden and the people on the ground there have coped and dealt with the unrest and the breaking down of a lot of what's going on in the denomination. We've talked to Jimmy Cravity about working across secular and Christian music. And like last week, we touched on the topic of religious legalism and childhood trauma. Nothing tough there, right? That's just easy with Ryan Stevenson. So this week, this week, what do we have? Well, I promise you, you are going to love John Shabaglian. He actually has a combination of Armenian and Mennonite descent. And that in itself means that his story is fascinating because he was actually asked to sing at the 100th anniversary of the Armenian genocide in Istanbul. That's just a little tiny bit of what we are talking about today because apart from that, John is also a solo singer-songwriter. He rose up in Christian music in the early thousands. What marks John as different in Christian music, and I would say like in the Christian church as a whole, is that he marries his musicality and worship leading with this mission. Now, there are two aspects of the interview with John that I think you'll really like, but there's a third one that I want to quickly touch on before we jump into this interview. Because a little while back on our social media, I asked you what topics you wanted us to cover. And one of those topics that you showed interest in was the level of accountability for people in church leadership and in Christian influence. Now, we have seen that go wrong so many times, right? Which is why so many of us have lost trust in the church institution or have had our own journeys with church and religion and God as a whole. What makes John so interesting and something we touch on in this interview is he actually runs a nonprofit called Psalmist Mission. It's actually about marrying great musicianship and performance with the theology of worship and raising up artists with integrity. All right, that covered the bases. You're about to get the who, what, when, where, why of John Shabaglian. It's a good time and it's fascinating. Then we will jump straight into the interview and you will hear some of his music from over the years. Friends, meet John Shabaglian. With a prolific career spanning more than two decades, John Shabaglian could easily be defined simply as a Christian music artist. Gaining a solid fan base from the year 2000 as part of the band Return, he has played alongside artists like Switchfoot, Tree 63, Pax 217 and LaRue, so it was no surprise when he began releasing solo music in 2006. But John's musical journey isn't quite the stock standard Christian industry trope that you expect, because since his early days, his music and songwriting has been embedded in mission. Here's some context. John has always loved to sing, boy bands, a cappella groups, all that jazz. And after learning guitar in high school, his passion for writing worship music that challenged hearts and changed cultures was really refined. It led him to travel as a musicianary for two years as part of the movement Lightstream. And coincidentally, he visited Australia twice in that time. 
On his return, he became a music intern at People's Church in Fresno, California, the city that he still calls home. Now over this time, John rose up to become a worship leader and he took part in multiple church albums. His first solo album, Stay In The Air, came out in 2006 and this began a decade and a half of prolific and acclaimed works where John merged his love of music with worship, preaching and ministry to encompass something really unique. Over the years, he's released multiple EPs and albums, including The Perfect Human Project. But 2015 held something special. You see, with Armenian and Mennonite heritage, John's family is written in overcoming adversity and song. His Armenian grandparents were actually rescued by Mennonite missionaries and escaped genocide during World War I. But for John growing up in California, this was not something that he was intentionally aware of until 2015, when he was invited to sing at the 100th anniversary of the Armenian genocide in Istanbul. Alongside Turkish violinist Orhan Celebi, their performance was included in the documentary Journey to Redemption. This paved the way for a new season spiritually and over the next three years, John would release multiple singles including Celebrity and the Unshakable Kingdom EP, all showing his tenacity and ability to explore the prideful parts of evangelical culture, challenging us to become more. He started the non-profit organisation Psalmist Mission in 2019 and in this he forged a new expression of his music and ministry. It's a nine month course, brings together professional music training and spiritual formation and John along with three other instructors train and equip biblical grounded worship leaders and kingdom artists around the world. And straight away John assured that Psalmist Mission and its changing roster of students took part in his music. His 2020 singles River Not A Pond and Bow Everything featured the movement and his co-instructor and musician Jared Ellison performed his single Light Show with him. Then in 2021, he released his first album since 2009. Titled Bow Everything, just like the single, it featured a duet with Aaron Schust and it showcases spiritual growth in a new and challenging season of life. Meanwhile, John is also the creator of Grace Note, a unique program bringing music and art lessons to the under-resourced children of California. So where does that leave John Shabaglian in 2003? Well, after collaborating with our friend Tema Tope and writer Sam Hart, John has released a single Symphony of Peace. Performed with Psalmist Mission and Tema Tope, the deeply personal track is a call for reconciliation, something he's experienced in his own life and family. I spoke to John about Symphony of Peace, how God has redeemed the brokenness of generational trauma through John's music, and why there is a need for care and accountability in music artists. Friends, you are going to get so much from this. John is a well. This is John Shabaglian. So John Shabaglian, can you introduce yourself? How do you say this with a Californian accent? I'm so impressed when an Aussie is saying an Armenian name from California, right? Well done. It's Shabaglian. You did great. Shabaglian. Okay. All right. Thank you. Points for me trying. I probably got about 95% right. With it. Seriously. But you can also tell I don't have the culture in my background. This happens every time I say a name. Every time. <laughs> And no, no doubt, no doubt. Well, Shabaglian, it's kind of intimidating, right? But it's kind of phonetic, so it works out. I'm half Armenian, half German Mennonite. My grandparents fled from the Armenian genocide, um, you know, and experiencing how God um, is writing generational stories that you aren't even privy to. And yet whatever we, what, whatever we call our version of life, you realize in some version you were handed a baton. And then when you realize that may have had like, you know, in my Armenian side, I got like 1700 years of Christianity in my bloodline. Like that's craziness. Right. And then on the Mennonite side, I got like, this, you know, this, this psalmist side of things and, and ministry layers and layers. And, and I, I, not to get all super deep, all fast, but I, I literally, Remember being in a in a chapel uh, that was built in our in Armenia, built in eight the eight hundred A.D. My eight hundred A.D. Okay, oh. and I was like, it was literally just me, Jesus, and cold rock. And I was like, God, is this like part of the reason you called me? Like, is this reason why you could give me songs and everything? Like, because like my great 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 grandparents' faithfulness to the cross. Like, this is crazy. And then it's really good actually for Americans. Um, to have a sobriety of our um, youthfulness. I remember going, I, I used to lead these music mission trips to London and I remember going to a pub that was built in, it says established 1949 or something like that. I'm no, no, I'm sorry, 197, I'm sorry, 1749. And, and I thought, dang, this pub is literally older than my country. And you know, wh- one of the reasons, one of the downsides of being young, which America is, 
it's this kind of cultural experiment is youthfulness kind of sometimes breeds arrogance. And we have this kind of like, well, we're the business and God's given this unique grace and superpower, this and that. And we don't realize everything I have was inherited grace, right? Favor, provision, whatever, right? And especially it's really healthy for uh, Americans to realize like whatever I have, I didn't just get because I'm like awesome. You know, and there's an appropriate humility, you know, and so for me, the ethnic side of things, which I didn't understand for years, uh, and then years later got roped up into my own kingdom cultural journeys. Uh, that's pretty precious how that all mu- merges together. You know what I mean? So anyways. Oh, no, I love that. I mean, so I can, as far as I know, I can only trace my heritage back to, oh, no, I think it was it was definitely England, but I think part of I was a convict. I was definitely a convict that stole a pocket watch and a loaf of <laughs> wow. bread. And so I know it's back there somewhere, but being able to trace your heritage back that far is so, so special. And especially like Australia, we were colonised uh, only, well, we were colonised later than when America was, as we know it now, was established, but we have like yeah. 60 to 85 thousand years of indigenous like culture as well which is and god's been working there the whole time so it's just why like god's just amazing how he just sort of brings all of that together um and i love that story about you going back to essentially your roots and being like wow totally i mean and and it added a real sense of sacredness because like even when we don't know who we are god knows who we are like and that's fire. I mean, the fact that you can share like, you know, like a, a stolen a pocket watch and a loaf of bread and, and, and you know how God will intervene in, in generational cultures. But like for me, and I appreciate kind of the heart of your podcast, like kind of leaning in and have an honest conversation. up in so much um, splatter uh, that I really didn't even, uh, I never really felt Armenian enough or German Mennonite enough. I didn't even really know who I was. And so I actually, you know, there's nothing like shaking to make things, um, you know, uh, you just are just, it's more survival, right? And um, and uh, to, to, uh, to realize in the fullness of time, like even when I didn't know who I was, God knew what he was doing. So I spent a lot of time in the African-American culture. I'm kind of like the soul chocolate guy, you know, with the, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, when I toured my, my, my bass player and drummer were always black and, you know, and I was kind of always the Armenian in the middle connecting the cultures and stuff. But then it was like, like, I, it was almost like the Lord is like, I let you, you know, stand with, be with and uh, bridge for a culture that's not yours, who had known persecution. And now I'm you're going to, and now I'm going to show you uh, who you are. And I got, I mean, if I had a hundred lifetimes, I couldn't have put myself in the story. But um, literally, um, again, I'm half Armenian, half German Mennonite. And on the hundred year of the Armenian genocide, I got invited by Mennonite missionaries to be the worship leader on a hundred on the, on the anniversary of the hundred year of the Armenian genocide in Istanbul, Turkey, to reconcile Turks and Armenians. Whoa. I mean, I know I should know that from your CV, but also that's just mind boggling. God is amazing. It's, 
it's mind boggling and terrifying and extraordinary. And so when we, you know, talk later about Symphony of Peace and these songs, the Lord has been writing healing stories in the middle of the vilest part of mankind. And I have been able to have a front row seat to a small little piece of that story. And it's absolutely insane. And so when you're talking about being a creator or creating, some people just want to get stuff off their chest. But I would rather now say, Lord, what do you want to say? What kind of stories do you want to pen? And could you trust me with sharing even the smallest part of some of that? So instead of just being heard or being, you know, followed, we could have your heart imparted down on a crack, you know, broken little rock called earth that needs your heart real bad. Um, and quite frankly, when you go being going from being a musician to like what I could say now a psalmist, a musician for God, honestly, I, I don't want to paint any other way. You know, it's um, so I've seen too much in an amazing way. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you can imagine being um, being on the soil with who is supposed to be your enemies on the hundred year of the genocide and your grandparents fled for their lives and your great grandfather was taken up on a death march and shot just because he was Armenian. And yet a hundred years later, I'm either going to teach my son to bless or curse and I'm either going to walk. I had to decide when they asked me to, to be a part of this historic reconciliation gathering. I mean, they made a documentary and all kinds of stuff. I had to decide first, am I Armenian first or am I Christian first? Wow. Wow. Scary, man. Wow. Oh, that is, I can't imagine holding that. I mean, I know that God enabled you to, but that's a lot. Can you, can you go back? Tell me as much as you want. Tell me your story. How did you get to this point where you, uh, so I was looking at your website and you talk about music on mission, which just made me excited. Um, and clearly hearing some of your story, that makes perfect sense. But tell me, how did, how did John Tabagli and how did he get here today in 2023? How did this person form and create this music? Well, you know, it's sweet of you to ask personally, but it is also a, uh, um, uh, I, I love the insightfulness of it because now, um, about five years ago, I started a work called Psalmist Mission, where we're now discipling and, and, and training other musicians to be trustworthy psalmists and on mission. So my goal now is to try to get to like 75 or 80 and die with a smile on my face because we raised up an army of other gifted artisans who are worship leaders, songwriters, but, uh, but but they'll bring their guitar under a bridge and play for, pray for play for homeless people and carry the good gospel that brings peace even in the middle of atrocities and stand between darkness on behalf of light and say no and protect the vulnerable and bring the good news and instead of saying ju- just saying Jesus is Lord they can say Jesus is Lord and all of a sudden the human soul can wake up yeah uh. so um you know, I, uh, it is crazy. You know, I, I, looking back now, it's, it's kind of feels like the journey God's taken me on. Uh, it's been pretty terrifying and it's been remarkable, kind of like both of those. And, um, and yet it, I feel like the journey of the last 20 years or so with the scriptures has been, is now becoming curriculum that I didn't realize, you know what I mean? To now pass on, to raise up more roars. And so the real question you asked, which is awesome, which is, how um, how does someone get to become a tool or even an arrow, if you will, that God could pull back for a while and then release for a divine purpose and actually hit a mark, right? Yeah. Instead of like, instead of, you know, how do you get really popular and get the most attention and then screw it all up and grieve God? Like, yeah. don't we have enough of those stories? Oh, you know yes, absolutely. Right? Like, and here's the deal. I'm a big fast sinner, right? So it's not like, I love what you were saying earlier. Like, I, we can't be the people that, you know, that we are disappointed with also, right? At the end of the day, all we can say is like, follow me as I follow Christ and try to bring shalom, you know, that word peace to a hurting world on behalf of God, you know, and with God, right? Hearts melt with fear. There's no peace inside. We have all we need. But still we can't hide All the longing, all the burdens Our souls cry out for His Shalom, shalom In our hearts and in our own May we find perfect Fade. 
And so, um, so yeah, I mean, now I'm very focused on what are the ingredients that make and form. I used to say form a psalmist, but now I'm actually saying what are the ingredients that fo- to forge a psalmist who would, who is both trustworthy and on mission? You know, um, how do you um, how do you how do you cultivate an artist who doesn't just want to build their empire that literally God has to knock over in the a little bit because it doesn't acknowledge his son? You know, we're either we're either more than we think we are, or we're we're little priceless ants on an ant hill that's on God's rock. You know what I mean? Like, yes. It's, it, yes. You know, and we think we're so amazing, but the reality is we're lost without him. We're lost without him. And um, and so anyways, the answer is how to, you know, how to get here, you know, and, and I, I, I'm, I am I, I am trying to be someone who can say, hey, guys, follow me. And I'm trying to go in the direction of God and I'm trying to leverage my life to help a hurting world for his namesake. But um, but how, how do you how do you get to that place? Honestly, it takes a ton of shaking. It takes a ton of brokenness. Um, uh, I, I had a, I, I, I took a bunch of our psalmist graduates uh, to do these, this community outreach a little bit ago. And I had this prayer leader come up to me and he's like, John, um, do you know where diamonds come from? And, you know, it was like this old Yoda talking to me. It was so awesome. And I'm like, I don't know. He's like, volcanoes. You know? Wow. He's like, you know what doesn't burn, John? Gold and silver. And I was like, Oh my gosh, like that's pretty deep. The most beautiful uh, gem that we can find on this planet comes out of something that absolutely would destroy life, a volcano. It destroys life. And yet, if you can find that product, you hold it up in the light and it literally explodes light in every direction. And the whole world stops and stares and says, how do I get one of that, right? And so God is literally in the process all over the earth uh, in Australia, California, Uzbekistan, and who knows wherever else, um, forging his diamonds. But oftentimes it comes with great cost. Uh, so I didn't have a lot of psalmist. I didn't have any psalmist fathers growing up. And I had, you know, I'm thankful for my mom and dad. I love them greatly, but I didn't. Um, I had a lot of also brokenness that I grew up into. And so um, growing up, I was just like, uh, if you're if you're real, God, you know, you better just come get me out of this craziness because this is super confusing. And, um, you know, you can go to school crying enough times. And and um, um, and uh, I just started kind of calling out to God to see if he was real. But I studied just about every religion there was because I was like, if there is somebody on the other side of the looking glass and he actually has real power and can help me in this situation, then I want to know that guy. But if this is all fake and a Peter Pan Neverland story, I ain't wasting my whole life on a Neverland story, you know? And it was actually out of desperation. I started taking a chapter a day before I went to bed in the Bible. And I'm an artist. I don't like to read, you know, and but I, but, you know, you get to the point where, you know, the turmoil in life um, was eclipsed by the need for help. And so guess what? John Shabaglin started started chapter a day before I went to bed, hoping that if God was real and he was in the scriptures, I might find some help. The straight up God on his truth, uh, Jessica, is that I met somebody way bigger than I planned. And um, that's not religious. That's not, even, that's not even church services or youth groups. That is straight up a, a vulnerable, fragile kid met his maker. It was like Pinocchio finally giving up and running to the arms of Geppetto. Do you know what I mean? And you can't finally, you can't really understand your purpose and destiny until you go back home to Geppetto, man. And um, that had started a journey and it was at the same time um that i i, I started i uh, sat down i started writing music uh, i didn't know piano at all um I, as the story goes when i was a kid um my um i guess i'll share this really quickly it's precious i have a twin brother and uh, my parents couldn't have kids and and so my mom prayed for a number of years and she prayed the prayer of hannah in the bible for god to give her a child to loan to god and uh, um, and then she got pregnant and gave birth to my brother. And then the doctor said, get ready for exhibition B. And she's like, what does that mean? And he's like, push again. And I'm like, here I come, you know? <laughs> and so, so you know, um, that's actually how it kind of went down. And so anyways, just to see God's hand, you know, um, kind of guiding us through all of it. And, you know, um, 
So he has been really kind, you know, even through the forging in the volcano, so to speak. And he showed me himself and he's let me, um, I've been, um, like I said, two bloodlines, Armenian and German Mennonite. So as the story goes, my mom said we, I was born in an Armenian apostolic church. She used to hold me and one at the, in Armenian churches, you would sing the Lord's prayer. It's called the high mare. Uh, and, and, uh, every, every, every week. And I guess as the story goes, my mom was holding me at eight months old and I was, uh, uh, singing along with the melody. So I don't know. I, well, I don't fully remember that, but, um, anyways, there seemed to be some musicality there. And then, um, you know, in high school through a lot of the, you know, shaking, I, 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 you know, God started healing me. It was like music therapy before that was cool. Right. Music therapy, like I just, I would lock myself in a piano. I didn't know anything, but I had an ear. So I started writing and um, God used music to both heal me, but also kind of um, open up sensitivity to him at the same time. And so I started writing and he was guiding me. And then, you know, eventually studied formally and was touring and making records and doing worship ministry. Um, but um, but the, the goal is not the stuff. The goal is, are you in alignment with your maker, Pinocchio? You know what I mean? Um, cause if you are, you're going to understand why you're alive. So, um, it's been quite a journey, uh, through that, but if that gives you a little lens, that's, um, that's kind of how we got to hear. When we take a glass to look at a star, we don't make the star bigger. We only see it bigger. And so you can't make God bigger, but you're only to see him bigger. And I'm sure that if we see, saw God bigger, we'd see people smaller. This is the day of the magnification of slick personalities. And just as we magnify slick personalities, we minimize God. Lights grown dim, but you outshine the sun Our music is tired, but you are the song Stars burn out, but you won't fade away We will be saved by no other name So fun fact, I'm also a twin. So I, oh. I've also had a lifetime of people saying, can you read each other's minds? To which I say, yes, of course. No. Here it comes. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> every time. Um, so I hear that. I'm like, oh, you get it. Um, I Absolutely. I would love to know um, through all of this and you you meeting God, but also it's, it sounds like, there were elements of your upbringing where you were at least you were exposed to religion and church and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Where did your your cultural heritage, your Armenian and Mennonite heritage, when did that? When did you become more aware of that and actually go, oh, this is part of my history and who I am? In addition to the fact that I'm Californian, how, when did this yeah. uh, realization really come into play for you, and how did that form you? Uh, that's an awesome question. That's an awesome question too. So, um, God has perfect timing, but sadly, I didn't know who I was for a super long time. Um, and, uh, like I said, because of the trauma, those you know, and we've uh, uh, my wife and I we started an anti-human trafficking organization for about eleven years, and that she's led and 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 we've worked in you know with some of the vulnerable and, and such. And when those who've experienced trauma, um, uh, trauma takes priority. And then it becomes survival, right? So not that in any way my experience was at th- those levels, but it was intense for me. And so that just took precedent. So the beauty of my culture, whether from food dishes to, you know, uh, to where, you know, where's grandpa from, to all those conversations, I didn't know. And uh, but like I said, the amazing thing was even when you don't know who you are, God knows who you are. And 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 I don't say that flippantly. I say that like literally he held out on me for years and it wasn't until 
Um, it wasn't till, um, uh, you know, around that 2015 window when I got invited into um, that Reconciliate Can Work in Turkey that I, uh, and it was after I spent a long time with the African-American community. So like I've mentioned, it was like he was having me uh, be adopted into a culture that I love. My, my sister-in-law is African-American. My uh, pastors have been black. My, minutes, uh, my mentors have been black. That was just my, my band was half black. Like I just always was kind of like I had all black brothers on the rhythm section, the white killers on the guitar, and I was Armenian in the middle. You know, like that had always kind of been my vibe, you know, and uh, the soul pop thing and with soul rock and whatever. And then um, and then but I look back now and I see, like I said, God was letting me be a part of and advocate for a culture that wasn't even mine. And then he, in the fullness of time, he invited me into the story of my own. Um, and that. Um, if you can imagine n- not feeling like you're, you know, th- what you actually are, half German Mennonite and half Armenian enough. And then, and then literally in the fullness of time, I had Mennonite missionaries invite me to work with, our, uh, to reconcile with Turks and Armenians as a worship leader in Istanbul, Turkey on the hundred year of the Armenian genocide. Like, like, are you got to be kidding wild. And then the crazy thing is I found out a year into this journey after my first trip, because I had like three, three years in a row. Um, and um, I found out that my Armenian grandma was rescued in an orphanage by Mennonite missionaries. No. Oh. You can't even write this stuff, dude, except God. He can write those stories and three generations later have a little psalmist kid sing about it. Like you can't even write that stuff. So when God, when you don't, here's the message to our listeners. When you don't even know who you are. God knows who you are. And John Shabaglin has personally experienced that. He's the anchor that never moves. Defender, you never lose. A father. Good. I'm getting teary and I know that we like we're 20 minutes in this is wonderful um I want to ask you about your single symphony of peace which you co-wrote yes. with our friend Teme Tope Teme Tem- Tem- Tope ah, you knew this. my bro I I'm know like, he's the best and he's forever forgive me for saying right? his name wrong he's the best I love him no no um can you tell me about symphony of peace how did that song come together how did you guys meet Oh, yeah, man. I mean, this is such a, a precious story, but it's cool to give you some of the backdrop of the reconciliation stuff. Because, like, you know, men and I are always this peacemaking folks. And, like, and that's been, and they literally rescued my grandma fleeing from the Armenian genocide. And then God gives me this reconciliation song with a Turk in 2015, who's a world class violist we released and debut in Istanbul. And then years later, we're writing more songs like a Shalom and, and I did with Aaron Schust. Mm-hmm. And now it's Symphony of Peace. Like, Lord, what are you doing? Like, what's happening inside of me? Why do I keep writing all these songs <laughs> like this? You know, and I, I've always loved to tuck scripture in the heart of my music, you know, because like a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. You know what I mean? But I um, uh, like to to be a part of um, writing a song with an amazing artist like Tim Atape who was also Nigerian, like I said, again, kicking it with the blacks has always been my natural vibe anyways. Um, but then the psalmist that we've mentored in psalmist mission, four years of discipling, and then our, we're in our fifth cohort, I took um, I took the cream from all four years of uh, training psalmists, and we made them the choir. So they're literally, the, they're like our choir is like our psalmist disciples that we've mentored, um, and not to mention literally in the middle of such a shaking season in our life, 
um, I, I step into this song, right, with Tim and Tape and my dear friend Sam Hart, was an amazing producer. And um, in three hours, we stepped back, like, after the session, and like, what just happened? And the Lord put my own daughter's name in a song. My daughter's name is Symphony. And the Lord was writing a symphony piece. Oh, man, I love that. That's so is that, good. Isn't that fire? I mean, you'd think I made up that story, but it's all true. I love how how like in a in your story, which and your your generation story, which has so much like it reads like a movie script in the sense that mm. it has so much to it. There is so much in each individual person, each individual story and culture in it. But God is now like he's creating something so exquisite and beautiful literally through you now because you're like you're creating music and and hymns and psalms out of it. And you're like your daughter's name is literally the name of a song. It's like God is creating something stunning out of out of what? Well, a volcano essentially. It's like he's created a diamond. It's totally. so amazing. Totally. Yeah. Uh. So now I, you know, I just, I feel floored and humbled. Um, the crazy thing is this single we just dropped um, is came right after uh, a record I, that we stewarded for two years. It was literally the spirit of God fell on me on this plane flight and I got this message and it was a, car- a theme we carried for the whole, for two years and it was called the how everything. So the crazy thing is like, and I did not ask for that cute little message because bow, everything is not cute. Okay. <laughs> like it's not cute. And actually when, um, when we, when Symphony of Peace came, it was in a, in the season of sh- incredible shaking that came right after two years of carrying a message called bow everything that we released in the middle of COVID. And it was like, Lord, what on earth are you doing right now? Because like, I feel like I'm both sharing your messages and on the operating table at the same time. Like, what is happening? You know? And he, it's as if he's like, while the bombs and volcano explosions are going off, he's writing a symphony. He's so in control. He's so, as I, the song I did with my dear bro, Aaron Shoes, that he's so in command. That he's literally sitting with his chair right next to the volcano with his gorgeous viola or, or violin, and he's playing a symphony because he's that able to write healing and restoration even in the middle of what would look like disaster. And that, my friend, is a message I believe he wants to say to his people now, which is we are so, by human nature, we just push away pain and push away shaking. Like, I wanted to go back to the way it was and life would be better. And the father's like, I want you close to me. And there's too much inside of you that repels me right now. And I, I can't, it's in the way, all these barriers. And we sing about grace, which is profound. But there are areas in our life that are actually keeping us away from him. As if we're rocking God repellent every day next to our cologne and perfume. You know, and we can sing about grace, but we're missing the communion because of sins in our life that aren't learning to trust. Him. And it's almost like after after a year of him shaking the whole earth, he's like, you guys listening now? Yeah, I meant what I said. Bow everything and you can be on my team. And then in his magnificence, he's never going to take more than he gives. He's a kind God. He doesn't take but he will unapologetically say, get rid of all the trash in your hand because I'm trying to put something beautiful. And it's scary when the trash is all we have known. It's our familiar, you know, it's the only thing we have known. And so it's scary, bow everything. And it, but all I can say is on that plane flight, I didn't ask for that message, but Spirit of God fell on me and I was bawling. And he took me to 2 Samuel 24, 24, where King David said, I will not offer to God something that costs me nothing. And the crazy thing is, if we bow everything, the symphonies that God may write will not only be breathtaking for us, but maybe your life might be able to part of being like divine me as foreign to squirt across a hurting world. And that would be the honor of a lifetime. We 
are your people We're your instruments of peace When playing the record But Lord have we traded The choir listening to this who are saying I want that but I don't know how to get to that point with God I can't even figure out if what I'm holding is trash or treasure what would you say to them how do they take that step towards God and give everything over such a beautiful sacred um, question you know almost want it's so precious I almost want to just pause and not rush into the answer because it's so important so important. Our souls need, just like Pinocchio couldn't find his purpose until he finally gave up and went back home to Geppetto. He did, couldn't find out who he really was, a real boy, who couldn't be that until he came home. Um, the amazing thing about God is he will let us run away. He will let us fill our hands with garbage on top of garbage and say, well, no, I need it. Or it's current or it's 2023 or whatever. Like I, ha- there's no way I have to do life the way everybody is. And God is saying, I can that you might have life and life to the full. So you can listen to all the noise, but I don't need to be followed on Twitter. God owns the universe. He doesn't need uh, to, he doesn't need for people to follow him because he literally is life itself itself. Right. And so your question was, what do you do when you feel like, like, I don't know if it's trash or treasure and yet you want to live with purpose. The beautiful thing is, and not only am I one life, but there are countless saints across this globe who are experiencing this, but they're probably not the superstar demigods that you're watching because God doesn't want any other name to be louder than the one name that saves and that's his son. There's only one name. It's not John Chabaglian that'll get your name written in the book of life. And ironically, we built, we build empires based around individuals who can't get us to the most important place in the world, which is in right standing with God, much less heaven, but heaven is just going to be extension with the fact that I was in right standing with God. But I want to encourage you wherever you're at right now, Literally, it is as simple as, God, I cannot do this on my own. I yield, you win, and I choose to follow you. If you're willing to take me, which the awesome thing is he take only take, he only accepts sinners. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, that's the awesome thing. Like, and if you're perfect, you can't talk to God, right? You know what I mean? I mean, I mean it best, you know what I mean? But he only talks to sinners, you know what I mean? But um, that broken heart that says, God, I bow everything. I am sorry for trying to keep the trash in my hand. I acknowledge that you probably have a better idea on my plan. And quite frankly, I don't want to miss what the story that you wrote over my life. If my life can be an example in that, I do not want to miss what God's written about my life. And he has countless stories that he's written. And, and everybody listening is part, has, has a personalized story written by the Father. He's that meticulous. I can tell you that in the journey of becoming a, you know, a, a fragile and, and a imperfect psalmist, you know, I can tell you about a time when I was collabing with this hip hop artist friend of mine, and we wrote a song called Jesus Loves You Like That. And we were prepping a music video uh, to shoot for Jesus Loves You Like That. And in the middle of the time, I had an encounter with God I'll never forget. And I realized that Jesus loved me like that. And in the middle, it sounds so 
it sounds so lame to say, but I literally did it. I knew that he loved everybody, but I didn't know if John Shabaglin was in on that story. I knew that God loved the whole world, but and, and I could sing it with conviction to tell Jessica and all her crew that they are important. But I, because of so much shaking, so much rejection and brokenness, I literally didn't even know where I stood. And he did some incredibly personal things to me that day where I will now know. It's in my kingdom journal uh, that I keep. And uh, now I, and it's one significant marker. Well, I always know that, that, John, that Jesus loves me like that. And I am a personalized story that, and he is wanting to walk with me. And so that, that is what remarkable because he sent his son and he crushed his son on the cross so that a holy God could put his Holy Spirit inside of a nasty t- uh, uh, carrier, which is us, right? It, like, you know, d- dirt and clean don't work except with God. He found a way, you know? Yeah. And be, but be, he literally had, he is so committed to us getting this answer right, he literally crushed his own son so that he could justify putting his Holy Spirit inside of an unclean temple. I, I got a son. He's my favorite son in the world. I only have one, but his name is Christopher. There's no way I'd give my son for, some, for someone else. Surely not people were flipping me off. But that's the magnitude of God. And so it literally is as simple as, dear God, I need you. Show me the story you've written and forgive me of what I've done and help me to follow. And then literally the destiny awaits. No sacrifice of praise required. Lord, do you see me that way? Please search the depths of my heart I wanna hear what you say Much of the time what I bring to you It costs me nothing at all Compared to all that you've done My sacrifice feels small But you're worth more My great reward When I see your cross And all it cost I bow everything So I normally finish my interviews with a few fun, quick questions. It feels really disingenuous to jump after you've shared something that profound. Before I go there, (laughs) is there anything else that you wanted to share about Symphony of Peace or anything that I have just not asked you about? Oh, you're so sweet. You know, I probably would love to just, uh, you know, working with Tim Atape and, um, and, and it has been such a privilege and because he has such a heart for reconciliation and I do too. Uh, we did an interview on CCM Magazine recently in Nashville a couple of weeks ago, and it was just so precious. Um, it just felt like God was with us while the cameras were on. And it was I like talking to my, my, my brown brother on the other side. We were finishing each other's sentences. And the story that kind of the divine strategies that God is unveiling in these shaking times are, quite frankly, they're remarkable. They're remarkable. And honestly, I want to spend the rest of my life finding out what other treasures he's got laid down in the volcanoes. You know what I mean? Uh, but, um, but I do want to say a little bit about, um, this, this, uh, being on mission and, and the privilege, in addition to being a worship pastor and recording artist for so many years, this, uh, this last five years, I've got to start a work called Psalmist Mission. So it's on my website, johnshabagan.com, or you can go to psalmistmission.org, like Psalms, like in the Bible, psalmistmission.org. And, uh, we have been leading this worship, um, cohort, uh, Psalmist Mission Worship Cohort in California. And uh, over the last five years, we're on our fifth uh, cohort. And like the psalmist family has grown to like almost 90 across California and now beyond. And they're like every color God makes, like Korean, Hispanic, Hmong, Ukrainian, African-American, Armenian. It's like a giant bag of Skittles. It feels like we're getting ready for heaven. You know what I mean? And um, 
And it's my favorite flavor of Skittles. You know what I mean? All of them. And so um, I, I now I've had the privilege to lead that and in, 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 um, not only is making music, but now pointing to the movement of discipling and training other musicians and artists for God. And so um, if you're interested in that as well, too, uh, psalmistmission.org or info at psalmistmission. Uh, maybe you, I have seen how, how God has used the prayer movement and the uh, the worship movement to literally merge. It's like peanut butter and jelly together with like this explosive mission. And literally I'm working with our mayor, deputy mayor, and we're watching um, uh, homicides plummet. We're watching like we're watch, watching statistics plummet and economic GDP launching through the sky. Uh, Fresno is now 13th in the nation. And I am seeing how he, cities can literally heal um, and how Psalmist Mission has even been not not all, but part of that story to bridge. And now the community used to call me to lead this event or that event. Now they're calling, hey, can Psalmist Mission come out and lead the National Day of Prayer or or this outreach or that outreach? And um, so this, I'm seeing a model being created um, that I believe can heal many other regions. I didn't come with the, it's not like it was over novel. I didn't come up with the word Psalmist. Little David used to play his harp for King Saul and demons would leave Saul. So God's been cooking this artistry thing and yeah. for a lot of years, but I am not playing around and I am blessed to be able to lead a work that is also, I see now a model that can replicate in many other regions. And it would be so exciting to me if what we've seen in California, um, not for the sake of Psalmist mission getting bigger, but for the kingdom of darkness getting smaller, if that model could be, it could be um, an inspiration, you know, music, goes in places other things just can't, you know? And um, and I say we have had too many stories of worship leaders and recording artists that are internal train wrecks. I think we have too many of those stories. And what I say is the, 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 the artisan, they matter because of their intrinsic value, not just because of what they bring to the table. And if we disciple and care about the money individually, they will bloom like a beautiful flower. You don't have to rip it out of the ground and say, it's my flower and kill it. You can water it and cultivate it, and then they will do just what God intends them to do. And they will lead the procession in front of the saints, just like they have for millennia, to remind the people of God, whether it's through COVID or whatever else, he is faithful. And it even will be a missional, um, missional tool to, to bring light into darkness. So if, uh, if that could be uh, inspiring, I, we'd love to hear from you on that too. And that has been something amazing to see what God's done in, uh, with Psalmist Mission. question for you that I want to finish with. If you could Please. go back to when you were 15, knowing what you know now, what would you tell yourself? Yeah, I think I know pretty quick. Um, I, um, one of the beauties, uh, one of the beautiful things, one of the diamond parts that came out of the volcano is that I was um, not having like a psalmist father, right? I didn't have that. Like, where's the 50 year old amazing artisan who like, uh, like is an incredible songwriter and artist, but he still has the same wife. And he like, you know, doesn't do shady stuff in the dark. Like, where's that guy? And I didn't have any of that. So I, um, so out of the void of not having like a psalmist father, I just remember early, my late teens, twenties, thirties, and now early forties where I had this burden to pour into others. It was like, God would show me some stuff and, and then he just like, man, what I share with you, kick it down to them, you know? So I've always been, I've been this kind of like weird 
you know, thinking about raising up others and leaving a legacy when I'm like in my twenties, you know, like who's thinking about that, you know, but the, the, so that's kind of the beautiful side. The downside is that I didn't live in the peace that I should have. I've been trying to help God fulfill the calling on my life for a bunch of years. And quite frankly, it's exhausting. <laughs> so I would tell that 15 year old kid, you got a call kid and God wrote a story and it's going to be amazing. But you don't need to help him make it happen. You just need to stay close to him and be obedient. Lord, I knew it. That you would come and rescue me, pull me through it. Even when I crumbled, cracked, and I blew. I love speaking to John. So after we finished the interview, we stopped and we talked a little while longer and he actually asked if he could pray for me. And it was just so lovely. So John, I want to say thank you, one for Symphony of Peace, but also for taking a time to chat with us, for sharing your heart and challenging the church to become more like Jesus every day. It's a really humble heart posture. It takes a lot of tenacity and it doesn't come with a lot of acclaim but it is so needed. So thank you so much, John. Friends, you can connect with John now on social media at John Shabaglian or johnshabaglian.com. I'm going to spell that for you, but as always, the links will be in the show notes. That is J-O-N-S-H-A-B-A-G-L-I-A-N. You can also visit psalmistmission.org for more details about Psalmist Mission. And if you'd like to get involved, it looks and sounds amazing. Meanwhile, you can buy, stream, download Symphony of Peace featuring our friend Tematope at all good music outlets. I believe there's actually a free download right now on John's website. So you can also head there, but make sure that you listen to that and pause and like feel the heart behind it. There's more to this song than just like a simple singing of lyrics. There is generations of the Holy Spirit's work and love and pain in this song. And that's what makes it so powerful. So please take a pause and listen to it when you have time. Thanks friends for listening to another great episode of Between You and Me. We are covering so many interesting topics. We're hearing so many fascinating stories this season. It makes my heart so happy. And we will be back next week with some old friends If you remember, way back in our earlier days, we talked to a couple, Lang and Renee Bliss. They are part of the band Bliss Bliss, who have been part of Christian music since the 90s. Both of them have experience with like some of the greats in Christian music, released their solo stuff and have come together. And they have this genre of sophisticated pop and their latest singles have been going off in the dance world. They are such good people. And I was so excited to engage with them, to hear an update on their story and to talk about what that means in light of where the church is currently at in terms of like our polarisation and, and navigating through COVID. So I think you'll really enjoy it. Make sure that you're subscribed to this podcast on whatever platform is your choice, but please go to Apple Podcasts and give us a rating and review. We really appreciate that. You'll also find us on social media at Between You Me Pod, and you'll find us online at between you and me pod.com again all the links are in the show notes friends thank you for this i will see you next week for another great episode as we deep dive into some nostalgia from christian music's golden days and the future of what it looks like today my name is jessica morris here's to hope How do you pick up the pieces 
of a home that's torn apart how do you believe for healing for a grieving broken heart it's only by the hope of jesus the light burst through the dark to meet us where we are from despair and says it's worth fighting for 